This talk is seven doc techniques rooted in empathy advocacy and why they work. I don't really want to give you tips today. I want you to walk away with an understanding so you can come up with your own techniques and frameworks. I'm Ryan Macklin, he or they. I'm a UX content strategist and technical writer. I'm also an empathy advocate. Uh, I'm a former game design uh, designer and a software engineer, both of which feeds into how I think about user content. And last but not least, I love emojis. To start, apologies to any neuroscience nerds listening, uh, as I'm going to be distilling a complex, dense, nuanced topic into an oversimplified framework for this sort of conversation. Uh, I'm not an expert myself. I've just done some work to make this really basic framework for lay folks for my, like myself uh, make sense of these concepts. Behold your brain. Specifically, a couple parts of your brain will highlight uh, in this simple framework. The first part is the amygdala. That's a tiny part tucked uh, near your brainstem that deals with being happy, sad, fight, flight, etc. And, and there's more. These cover, I, I prefer the word basic to primal uh, elements of life. On the other side of the brain, far away from the brain stem, is your prefrontal cortex, the part that handles executive function problems, complex problem solving, conscious self-control, and civilization-based things like that. And incidentally, I say civilization-based rather than civilized intentionally, since civilized, like primal, can be a very loaded term, but it's still important to relate that this is about civilization-oriented things that come up. When you feel your emotions trying to take the reins in your mind, that's your amygdala responding to some external stimuli by flooding your body with all sorts of chemicals. You're likely familiar with at least one of those, which is adrenaline. For reasons we'll talk about soon, that flooding reduces your prefrontal cortex's ability to really engage with what's going on which is a real bummer when whatever stimulating your amygdala like that is a civilization-based issue. That's part of why it's often hard to deal with real-world problems. We can take that idea and come up with some useful framing devices, which I call emotional profiles. Each of these profiles represents someone struggling with a broad emotional st uh, state that is restricting some access to their civilization-oriented problem-solving brain. We've got Avery, the anxious armadillo, who represents people who are avoidant and want to roll up in a ball. We have Finley, the furious ferret, representing people who are combative and really uh, just like sort of emotionally, sort of, uh, you know, in a very basic way, want something to fight. Uh, Pat the proud peacock represents people who are looking to reduce their sense of vulnerability by putting themselves over others, um, like putting others down. Similar, but not quite the same as the fight-seeking Finley. Uh, and Blake, the burned-out bear, represents people who have run out of energy. So rather than being flooded with emotional energy, they don't have much to pour into their prefrontal cortex. It's similar in some ways to our avoidant Avery, but from a different place energy-wise. Those impulses, Avery, Finley, Pat, and Blake, are by design unpleasant to experience, which leads us to look for exits from whatever situation we're in when we feel them. We can think of the general pool to get out of such unpleasant situations as emergency exits. Avery's emergency exit is abandoning the moment for a safer, less challenging place, which might be needed for that given moment, but overall it doesn't solve what problem they're in. And if they don't come back to the problem, that just becomes a really problematic space for them to exist in. Finley's emergency exit is to win at something, to triumph, uh, to remove a feeling of powerlessness which can be really terrible if the only thing they can perceive fighting or the only thing they feel is, is, is available to fight is someone or something trying to help them. Pat's emergency exit is to control others by demeaning them, by putting them down, which is also a way of dealing with powerlessness, but it's more passive aggressive than full on argumentative, which can trick oneself into feeling like they're not being emotional then when they definitely are acting off of an emotional impulse. And Blake's emergency exit is to just check out, to rest mentally or physically, uh, to just sort of go blank or whatever. Uh, that might be exactly what they need uh, in that moment, but it can go too far if it turns into a, to a pattern of avoiding something that they know is going to be mentally taxing and that just you know keeps them from engaging with it at all. I see a goal of UX and customer support is to guide people away from those emergency exits that don't solve problems. We want to guide them to exits that help them resolve their issues and move on with their day. And this is hard because it means finding ways to address those various impulses that pull people into stress towards those emergency exits 
and, and finding ways to keep them from uh, just going there. It would be easier if we could silo our emotions, but it turns out we're not perfect at that. Let's take an example of having eh, just an okay day, then suddenly getting upset because you read a social news headline or a bit of toxic social media. Then maybe half an hour later, your computer freezes up. So now you have this impulse that makes you want to flip the table, metaphorically or genuinely. Maybe you wouldn't have such a strong impulse to that freeze up if not for your brain already being primed with stress chemicals. That sort of frustration or distress lives in your body and adds to whatever feeling you're experiencing next and then whatever you're experiencing after that and then whatever you're experiencing after that. To give you a visual metaphor, here's a crude analogy. Think of the pathway from your brainstem to parts of your brain as being a neurochemical highway with one of the earliest stops being your amygdala and the prefrontal cortex being a stop far uh, on the path. When you feel plenty of mental energy and aren't flooded with those crises neurochemicals, and the highway runs pretty smoothly. Some traffic gets off at the amygdala to handle hormone regulation and stimuli, and plenty gets through to the prefrontal cortex to deliver information and chemical energy and send responses back to the rest of the body. But when your body is flooded with those crises neurochemicals, that highway to the prefrontal cortex it gets all messed up. Uh, a little bit of traffic can brave the flooding to get through, which is why sometimes you can think your way into getting a little calm and regulated rather than purely reacting on this dysregulated moment. But overall, that traffic's really restricted, which means you'll struggle more with articulating your problems, handling nuanced situations, separating sources of stimuli from other things you're currently experiencing, uh, civilization brain-oriented things like that. Uh, and that really sucks to experience, which is, again, why we seek those quick exits that I talked about, even when they aren't the best exits for us. The flooding and restriction of the prefrontal cortex is by design. Your civilization brain is slower and more expensive than your basic brain. And in a crisis stimuli situation, your body assumes that you need speed and efficiency to survive. And I mean literally survive, as in if a I don't act now, I'm dead because something is going to kill me, eat me, you know, attack me, whatever sort of sense of survive. And that's built in to keep us alive, both individually and sort of as a, as a group, since we're a social species. Which, again, really sucks when that crisis stimuli comes from a civilization-oriented issue and is best resolved by your civilization-oriented brain. Whether that's a problem to resolve with a clear mind or just a simple moment where in a clear mind you would know, oh, I should just sort of go ahead and shrug that off. Everything said, and this is really important, there is no shame in having emotions. This is one of the most important concepts I've taken away from my journey in trauma therapy. Thinking there are wrong emotions is harmful because it creates unhealthy relationships with things like anger, grief, envy, etc. that pushes people to avoid confronting those emotions and moving through them to, to just kind of get past them and to better understand ourselves. Thus, it keeps those emotions inside our minds and inside our bodies for longer and longer. Uh, and we really can't control the emotions we experience when the stimuli hits as much as we like to. So it's really important to say that every emotion is valid, for real. That said, there are crappy behaviors, and I think this is important to address whenever talking about how any emotion is valid. Just because every emotion is valid doesn't mean that every action based on those emotions is valid. It's okay to be angry. It's legit, totally you know, on par with the human experience to be angry, but it's not okay to yell at a support agent trying to help you. Uh, having no shame in feelings doesn't justify acting on those feelings in harmful ways. So do try to avoid those impulses, you know, when you're able to. Uh, and, you know, when you recognize that it's a good thing, you know, apologize, you know, as a way to address some of the harm you've done. So what's empathy advocacy? It's a collection of principles and practices taken from the idea that we need to meet our users where they are rather than live in a fantasy world where we wish every user was quote-unquote rational. I've drawn from my backgrounds in technical writing, UX content strategy, gameplay design, and neurodiversity, along with incorporating what I've learned from trauma therapy, cognitive accessibility, differences in cultures and languages, etc. And I've formed this mission statement for the concept, which is that everyone's lives are hard, Let's learn to account for that when we help people, whether that's writing for thousands of users we'll never talk with, or we're directly assisting individuals. And as far as acting on this, I have three overall directives I try to live by. Uh, first, don't write solely for calm people. Uh, have in mind distressed and low energy people when you're writing, because those are the people in most need of your help. 
If you take that focus, you'll also help calm regulated minds as well. Second, recognize the cognitive cost users have to spend processing your writing. People are always bleeding cognitive energy, so consider how you can write in a mental energy efficient way. And some of the upcoming tips show ways to approach this concept. Third, respect that what you put into the world leaves a psychological footprint on those experiencing it. And to focus just on user writing for that idea, sometimes that's some positive, like when people feel like they understand what they need to do because of your copy uh, as a help doc or, or on the screen uh, and can proceed without the stress or confusion. Uh, sometimes that ends up being a negative, like if you write an error message that happens to be cryptic and that ends up sparking distress in a significant number of folks. With that groundwork laid, let's get into the seven tips and techniques. Number one, employ visual storytelling. I love storytelling and I love engaging visual design. Brains grab on the stories, which help keep folks' attention and gives them something to relate to abstract concepts to. We humans love narratives. That's how we make sense of things from showing cause and effect we can understand to having a way to relate to some process or concept being described to our own needs and experiences. Uh, at least as long as the stories being told are actually relevant to the person who's reading or listening to it. Uh, for sighted users, brains also grab onto different sorts of visuals like diagrams and pictures. That's mentally engaging in ways different from processing language. This gives you some opportunities to give brains two different ways of engaging ideas or the same idea at the same time, which can increase those brain success rates of understanding or internalizing whatever you're trying to convey. And if done well, thinking about storytelling structures also prompts thinking about accessibility, not just visual accessibility, but also cognitive accessibility. Uh, no one is engaged by walls of poorly organized text that doesn't try to connect with the reader. I've read a lot of text written by engineers that assumes the reader will do all the work of trying to connect with the text uh, on their own. And in my early days, I definitely wrote text like that. And that is an accessible content design. Here's an example of a high concept doc. And no words on the screen, so you aren't distracted by trying to read an example doc while listening to me. This doc has some basic formatting with the title headers, maybe the bulleted list uh, at one part. It's not the worst wall of text I've seen or written, but it's a bit dense and it could be difficult for some people with low prefrontal cortex energy to keep processing it. But with a little and just a little addition of a couple images to relate to key points, we can create uh, points in the doc where key concepts are restated through those two different uh, mechanisms of uh, text and visual. And then we can look at the doc's current organization uh, with that kind of idea in mind of, of how to create those, you know, uh, more uh, key concept points and see if that organization is doing the best job of relating it to its readers. We break up the flow a little to give the brain a moment to rest uh, the language processing part without actually leaving the page and getting distracted somewhere else as a form of resting. Uh, and because we're not using images for every single beat, every single moment or whatever, uh, we're using that as a way to point out which parts of the doc are maybe the most important to take away, the most important to internalize, or sort of the most foundational. Number two, use synopses. Uh, have some sort of summary line, brief banner text, or even a TLDR primer at the top of an email. This is a powerful technique. It highlights key information right away at a lower cognitive cost than having to parse an entire piece and figure out what's key and what's supplementary. Uh, absolutely critical for anyone with a low attention span in the moment to succeed with your text, but that's because they're low on your chemical juice or are distracted by other things in life. And for those who have the attention and interest to read further, you've primed them for how to relate to and internalize your text much easier. Which brings us to cognitive glue, uh, a term I've, I've already thrown around a little bit. It's a term that I use for whatever factors cause an idea to stick in the mind. Sometimes a person brings their own cognitive glue to the party due to interest or pressing needs. Like I, I love uh, woodworking, so I definitely will grab onto something about woodworking uh, and sort of more so than something I'm less interested in. But we can help everyone by facilitating cognitive glue, regardless of whether or not they're bringing their own glue to the party. And priming techniques like synopses helps do this. Cognitive glue, like anything with the brain, requires energy. With someone with a lot of mental energy, they can try to make their own cognitive glue by putting effort into sifting through text to find something that relates to the situation, 
or trying to make sense of various fake steps in a new process or whatever other things that they are trying to get out of a dense text, a dense set of steps, you know, something that has enough text to, to have to spend some time reading. Uh, if someone doesn't have a lot of energy in a situation where they have to spend some time reading a bunch of text, and they're out of luck if they're on their own trying to process that text. Whatever ideas that you're trying to convey, they'll just bounce right off. Uh, they might not even realize it. But through priming information, we're both helping the high mental energy person use less of their energy, which gives them more energy for everything else they have to do next. And of course, the really important part, which is that we're helping the low mental energy person have a chance to succeed at retaining information by asking less of them. Synopses and other priming techniques are energy efficiency techniques. And I love them. Number three, give time frames. This particularly applies to notices about technical problems, outages, and other temporary issues, which can inconvenience or distress users. If you don't provide some sort of time frame, like check back in an hour or have ETA to having your power back at 6 a.m. Sunday, you're injecting uncertainty. And uncertainty creates or engenders sort of vicious voids in the mind. For those in distress states, dwelling in a vicious void draws out crisis activation and heightens emotional responses which is terrible for resolving prefrontal cortex-oriented problems. And providing some time frame, even a vague guess or conservative estimate, uh, has at least a chance of reducing that sense of void. Uh, to visualize this metaphor, here's a small, barely perceptible void. What someone feeling calm in the moment experiences when they see we are having technical difficulties with that doesn't have any sense of time frame, resolution path, anything like that. Provided that this sudden situation doesn't then jar them out of their calm, of course, they're able to move on and, and continue. Maybe slightly annoyed or whatever, but broadly can continue. But once someone's dysregulated, the void gets big and gets scary. The bridge to cross it to feeling calmer and more stable and more secure about the situation is rickety. It takes a lot of energy to cross that bridge to regulate yourself and focus on ebbing the crisis near chemical flooding. And for those with past fears or traumas relating to that same situation, like say someone in a system outage causing them strife because then they suddenly couldn't pay a critical bill on time and it became a mess for them for weeks. In situations you might not even know happen with these users since you're writing for many, many users. This sort of situation is more fraught for them. They might not even be able to cross it at all and thus they'll carry that stress and that distress with them to everything they're doing next which not only includes maybe trying to get support for their problem, but just everything. Again, we are really crappy about living our lives in silos. Adding a time frame doesn't make the void go away entirely, especially if someone has that sort of internalized reason for feeling distressed or is just primed to feel distressed. But it can provide some stability to help them move through this stressful moment and to get to a place where they can put energy toward productive or helpful things. So this assumes your timeframes are trustworthy, and if you break these or trust routinely, there's no way your timeframes will give any sort of stability. Number four, include short videos. By short videos, I mean bite size, like one topic or process, three to five minutes if you can. Videos are great for those struggling with reading comprehension, whether that's a chronic or a temporary condition, or if they feel stressed out and would feel more secure watching the process while listening to someone explain it, which goes back to our visual storytelling. Uh, technique or tip. Younger audiences are used to using videos, and if we aren't trying to keep up with the times, we're leaving users behind. And to emphasize a short playtime, just like a small scroll bar on a page can help that page seem not so daunting to reader process, a short playtime inherently tells the viewer that a process isn't daunting. They'll see that playtime before they start watching the video, so you'd better believe that they've already got some preconceived notions about the topic or about the presentation based solely on that video's length. This is a good opportunity to introduce another reason that this and similar techniques work, which is that reassurance is a great uh, move. It's a great at helping folks come back from a dysregulated or distressed headspace. Some anxious or frustrated users aren't necessarily capable of receiving direct reassurance, like someone literally saying, you're okay, you're doing this correctly, probably because we're rarely or never there to give that. But even if a support agent is there to give that, you know, it might not be well received in that moment. But indirect reassurance, 
like following along somebody else and someone else's process video can give that feeling because it projects a sense of, hey, you're not alone. It gives someone the ability to relate their experiences to something that they trust, especially if they trust a video that you know tells them what they're going to do if it comes from the same sources like a help doc or it comes from somebody who feels like a trusted communicator. Reassurance moments in whatever form they take offer folks a chance to pause, to breathe, to reassess, to regulate, which is incredibly, incredibly great for being able to move past the stress and get back into your prefrontal cortex mind. Of course, I, I'd be remiss if I pretended like there were no pitfalls to video. So let's run through uh, these couple real quick. We all know videos cost more than text to produce and maintain which is prohibitive a lot of the time. And incidentally, if you are in a situation where you might be able to make a video, but aren't sure if you can keep it updated, and since you can't see into the future, assume you're not sure if you can keep it updated, at least include a date somewhere in the video itself. Platforms aren't always great at making their dates visible, and uploads can change times and stuff like that. So you know, see if you can put a date in the video itself. That can help people know if something's relevant. And... Yes, videos aren't inherently accessible. We've already talked a bunch about accessibility, so that shouldn't be a surprise for it to come up. This means you still make docs for people who can't watch videos or who don't trust videos as much as they do docs. That's why this tip is include short videos rather than use short videos to not suggest that they're a pure replacement for reading for everyone in every situation, but they're great to involve in your process. Number five, reduce screenshots. The problems I've seen with using too many screenshots, things like over-reliance on images to convey directions can lead to inaccessible writing. Uh, creating a daunting page uh, is pretty easy. Uh, take, for example, a page with an eight-item numbered list showing all the steps. If you can show that, show that or most of that within the browser's viewport, that's great. It tells the user, this is all you need to deal with. But when a page floats over the viewport, like over and over to several viewports, the scroll bar suggests a far longer and thus far more time or energy consuming task than what you're necessarily really asking. By using images frequently, it separates steps um, that doesn't allow them to gel in the mind as a cohesive unit. Like if you have three or four steps that are really one step you're really breaking down uh, you know, into discrete parts, you can not have an image separate them the mind can grasp all that as basically a compound but single concept. And it doesn't leverage cognitive tricks that help people learn from themselves. Cognitive microfiction, it's what I call those moments where you have curiosity or some issue your brain is trying to solve, and it has to work just a little bit to get that info. It's not expected to be a massive mental expense. It's just a little tiny expense. It's just, oh, I need to find the settings in the menu that just appeared. Oh, there's where it says settings, that sort of level of expense. It's a combination of a question and effort to discover, which increases the possibility of that idea that they learned somehow gluing in the mind. Another way I frame the power of cognitive microfriction is the thing I call the GPS principle. If you move to a new place and always use your GPS navigator around, you're likely to more slowly learn your neighborhood than if you at times engage your problem-solving mind to get in or out to discover, to, to try something else. Uh, and that's because navigating on your own is engaging that problem-solving brain, which can foster that sweet, sweet microfriction effect or possibly slightly more friction if you get lost or something like that. But then again, that's, uh, that's a friction effect that helps something glue in the mind. So hopefully it's clear that I'm not saying don't ever use screenshots. I want you to use them mindfully with intentionality. Uh, here's what I consider valid times to use screenshots in my work. I use screenshots when I need to orient the user at a critical moment, namely to reassure them that they've done some steps uh, correctly up to this point, especially for those who might be nervous or, or if there's a starting screen with an overwhelming number of options and I want to firmly direct how to begin so they don't get lost in that first moment. To highlight a complex or critical step, if we don't use screenshots often, then when we use them, it is a way to highlight extra attention for something. In the same way that if we don't bold everything, we can use bold to actually draw you know, a distinction to something. When you use something constantly, it no longer becomes a distinction element. 
uh, which uh, means that you can't use you suddenly remove that distinction element possibility from your your writing toolkit. When writing UI, it's especially confusing in some moments. I'll definitely like look at screenshots then. And writing around that confusion, such as a poor UI situation, basically often needs a visual aid for a lot of users, depending on your user profile. And for a process someone does like rarely, like say once a year or just like one time when they're starting uh, their account or like starting a new job or something like that. If it's a complex or daunting UI, and I'm told the UI isn't expected to change in the relative future, definitely is, is a reason to say, okay, I'll go ahead and put a bunch of screenshots in. Number six, rethink FAQs. Uh, I like to say FAQs are where information goes to die, and I love this slide. Uh, FAQs generally start harmlessly enough, like something short that just needs to be thrown together, much like, say, putting a couple of things on a desk that you need to find later. And it's easy to find each individual item when you need to look for it. Um, but over time, as all these items pile up on the desk or the metaphorical desk that is the FAQ, uh, the pile becomes worse than useless, sucking time away from people who are trying to address the problem in the moment, but are you know being sucked into trying to parse and navigate your FAQ. Uh, and while appending to an FAQ uh, can be seen as a low cost on a writer, uh, it causes huge costs on users trying to sift through that information to get what they critically need, and they wonder if they can trust the info they seem to find. And this is not a way that actually promotes fruitful microfiction. This isn't a negative form of friction, so this doesn't really apply to the idea of fruitful microfiction. So imagine someone with low cognitive energy desperately trying to find the info, hoping that a control or a command F will help them find some specific term in the sea of words and the sea of subtopics. Uh, and then, and that only even works if they're guessing exactly the right thing to do, and if the FAQ pages they looked at don't have the the dreaded uh, collapsible sections that users have to manually expand because they default to collapse. Such a user is on the verge, you know, if they're on the verge of frustration or a meltdown, prone to tilting as poor, unreliable organization makes everything unclear. They're likely going to get pushed over the edge uh, with this uh, sort of situation. If you want to treat people well to in, in providing them this sort, this sort of content, perhaps it's like a bunch of different troubleshooting facts or, or a bunch of different things to know about the, a product before, you know, before like on their first day or something like that, don't just throw it into an FAQ. The scope of the material. Like you can break these up into single scope docs, whether that's a doc that solves one problem or a doc that solves a tightly scoped set of related problems. When you're making those docs, use strong titles to showcase that scope. Rather, I mean, a big and helpful title of something like FAQ, no one knows what's going to be in there. That's terrible, like SEO. That's terrible setting expectations for what the user can expect in there. When you give somebody a more specific title, such as common connection problems, that can engender more of a sense of trust and reliability in the content that will actually address problems or concerns. And don't use titles that overpromise the idea that this particular page will answer to whatever you're trying to find. That way, if somebody runs into a problem, they see that page, the problem isn't covered in that page, you know, they can think to themselves like, oh, I guess this isn't a common issue. What's my next step? And hopefully the doc says, you know, other steps or like, you know, that they click on contact support or something like that. And step seven, die on fewer hills. This means you don't need to fight every fight. Uh, that is exhausting. And I say that from experience. This means use your social capital wisely. Uh, that's the goodwill you hopefully gain with people as you work with them, show your value, help people out, and try to be likable, useful, things like that. Respect your reservoir of social capital as you don't have an infinite supply. None of us have an infinite supply. Let people learn from their mistakes, which includes you. Uh, you can't force people into agreeing with your educated assessments all the time. So sometimes just let folks do what they're going to do. Maybe it turns out that they're right and you're wrong about that, which is a great learning opportunity for you and perhaps a chance to show others you're willing to like negotiate, learn, show humility, grow. Or it turns out you're absolutely right. And later down the line, and this has happened with me, folks come to you later saying that they wish that they had went your way, which can give you some credibility when those moments happen, because then people learn like, oh, I wish I had gone your way. Maybe I'll trust you next time. 
I made this uh, Diane Fewer Hills meme as a reminder. And I also have a section on my whiteboard called Hills I Didn't Die On, where I make a check mark each time I choose to let an issue go as sort of a way to give myself some like internal closure on that thing to say, no, I am letting it go. Check. It is now done. I'm not going to try to deal with it anymore. Uh, and, and this uh, last bit here is important, which is that advocating for empathy means caring for yourself. If you're low on energy while dealing with the impulses that want to hijack your brain, uh, how are you going to really effectively help somebody else with theirs? I mean, sure, you can squeeze out a little bit of effort in such times, but you know it won't be your best work if you're constantly running on empty. So take care of yourself, whether you're you know, recognizing your break, a breather, a walk, a, a glass of water, uh, whatever it takes to take care of yourself. So those are my seven tips. I like to end these talks with a call to action of some sort to think about something over the next week, uh, something that's a little bit more practical and focused than just sort of leaving you here saying, hey, thanks for listening. Uh, so a couple of questions to consider uh, over the next week uh, as you go about your work, your life, uh, which is to ask yourself, uh, how would someone in one of these various states, like a panic state, um, take in what you're saying or writing? And maybe that'll inspire you to change your wording or to reinforce some of the decisions you made without like, entirely realizing them. And how can you help people who are disengaged or lacking cognitive energy? How can you help those people be successful? Same sort of sentiment. Uh, I hope you'll think about these over the next week and maybe journal about them if you're that sort of person or talk with them, you know, talk with somebody else about this. Thank you for being awesome. I'm on the Right to Doc Slack. It's my last name, Macklin. And feel free to message me if you try, you know, that, that exercise. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and let's go to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Ryan, for uh, that great presentation. Yes, that worked. <laughs> Yay! Thank you, Ryan. And I'll be, I think, it, um, I saw a couple of questions popping up in chat. And if people do have more, please drop them in the chat so that we have a lovely discussion now for the next little bit. Um, and Carrie, are you set to host our... I have. Yeah. I have been collecting your questions. Give, in the yeah, give me one minute while you're collecting those questions. Sure. Uh, I'm apparently about to lose power on my laptop that is plugged in. <laughs> uh, all sorts of technical stuff tonight. But yeah, go ahead and collect the questions real quick, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just sure. uh, plug it, make sure it's plugged in. Yeah, for sure. And anyone who has hasn't um, gotten a question in yet, please feel welcome to. You're also welcome to just pop your comments in there. But if you do have a question, uh, proceed it with the queue so it'll make it easy for me to find it. That's great. Very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Great. I've had some of the same problems, I think, perhaps with the mysterious deciding not to charge problem on the laptop. <laughs> it comes and goes. I didn't believe and say, yep, I'm plugged in, and I'm still going to allow this to charge right on down to zero. <laughs> wow. When you most need me, I will <laughs> fail you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've done that to me in meetings. Yes, it has. <laughs> Sometimes there are probably some meetings where you wish it would do that and it and it didn't. <laughs> but others where you really would like to be tuned in. No, well, Ryan works on that. I suppose uh, I could one of the comments I could uh, bring up that I mentioned in chat was uh, talking about how FAQs or where information goes to die. I've often seen FAQs start off as some repository that the support team makes because they keep getting these questions over and over. And I think that's where FAQ comes from. We, support staff, are always getting asked these questions frequently by customers. Um, and then it becomes something they use because once someone has figured out the answer, you know, why, re why uh, reinvent the wheel? But that is made for them. And assuming that you can just open it up to users is possibly not <laughs> uh, not the best approach. That's right. Yeah, I, love the yeah, I mean that, that, the FAQs. <laughs> the a lot of times, yeah, it is. You get that a lot with like support agents or whatnot who own documentation. Uh, like it comes from a good place, but it is. Um, uh, without good information architecture and good principles, like even just saying, 
uh, I had a rule with one health center that I ran, which is if this affects fewer than 2% pe of the people, I won't put it up unless I can absolutely make sure that every search term cannot be misconstrued with a problem that affects more people. Mm -hmm. um, because that is better to, to just have those people, you know, come in and ask the same thing that a tech has a quick answer to than it is for our help site to become uh, untrustworthy due to that, due to essentially that sort of perception. All right, Ryan, are you ready for questions? Yes, I am. This is actually a bunch of good ones. I, had to, I had to go outside and find a different, like actually <laughs> physically outside my house to find a different charger to use. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> more, more speed, speed moving. Yeah. All right. So we have two kind of related questions. Actually, one came in early and one came in late. So the um, question uh, that I'll begin with, and I'll maybe ask both at the same time. Um, do you think it's important to allow for documentation that can change depending on a person's uh, preferences or accessibility needs? Um, and then somebody else wondered, um, how do you evaluate documentation decisions um, to try to create something that's most helpful to most people? So this is a question of different people with different needs, and how do you accommodate them? So because of essentially the expense of docs or uis or whatnot like if you create multiple docs for the same sort of thing you're creating an expense you're you're not creating single sources of truth which unfortunately means that they're going to get out of sync at some point like it ends up causing unfortunately more problems than it would end up addressing um what i do is i when i'm writing something I essentially have in mind the, the sort of the concepts of, okay, so how is this going to affect somebody who, uh, is, am I using any unintentionally combative language that makes someone want to fight me? Or am I using language that tries to help them sort of feel like, okay, you know, they're on the same page? And or like they're like we're you know we're with them instead of against them. Uh, am I making sure that I can create material that um, has a way of creating that early cognitive glue that can help somebody who is in a bored, distracted, um, you know, or other sort of essentially uh, low uh, low cognitive bandwidth state uh, to uh, to be able to uh, make it easier for them to use what bandwidth they do have to process it. Uh, and am I doing anything to, uh, that I sort of recognize as possibly unintentionally, uh, supporting, uh, a general sense of, of fear or dread. Um, I just try to check to see if I am doing these things. Um, they're really, really vague. This is actually much easier to talk about, honestly, with like making a UI, uh, you know, handle these sort of things with um, uh, with a bit more respect, especially when it comes to like error messages and and weird instructions and stuff. Uh, but when it comes to documentation, it really is just like it, those. It ends up translating into usually things like make make the articles you know focused on a topic, even the sort of multiple multiple aspects of that topic. Um, you know, make them to the point, don't, you know, preamble because those preambles take up cognitive uh, energy and, uh, and don't reassure. Uh, and essentially look at how our tone and voice, uh, whether that can change or not. I'm in an org where that really can't change. Um, but, you know, are, are there ways in which we are being friendly? Are there ways in which we're being like too friendly to the point of being dismissive? Like, what are we what are we doing with our tone and voice to reinforce uh, either positive or or negative um, uh, sort of paths of um, uh, sort of like uh, escape paths or problematic paths or, or good resolution paths that um, like, what are we doing there? That's unfortunately and very maybe not helpful nuanced answer. Um, but that's the, it's, I guess the high level answer to that. And I feel like it'd be kind of easier in some regards to get specific. I'm like, here's a specific thing of this, but I don't have any offhand, any examples to sort of share in that regard. Um, so, but hopefully that answered a little bit of that. 
Yeah, and if we have follow up questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I can Absolutely. I can move on to a nice specific question. Well, these are all great questions, but here here's a specific question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, any advice for keeping documentation up to date, especially videos? This came up when you were talking about videos, um, since since things change so quickly in tech, and mm -hmm. since videos take so long to create and update. Um, do you have any advice for keeping that so, that kind of documentation up to date? So let me say docs, uh, let me split that up into docs and videos. Um, docs, if you have a content management system that kind of allows you to have snippets, you can create still a single source of truth component by saying, I'm changing this one thing here and it will propagate to these other pages. And yes, I should look at those other pages. But if you have that sort of uh, infrastructure, that can help a lot. Um, if you don't have that sort of infrastructure, um, the unfortunate answer is the, the way to do that is to make sure you're funded because that's exp like, you know, because essentially dealing with multiple source of truth problems is expensive uh, and you, you can't keep up with it if you don't have the, the, you know, the work bandwidth to do it, which means, you know, whether you're funded enough for it or not. Uh, I'm typically in underfunded orgs. I think most of us who are writers are typically in underfunded orgs. Um, so, um, but if I know that something is a routine thing that tends to change, I try to like slot it in my brain as like, what are, what are all the places where something has to change? And then can I also use that as a way to figure out how to at least refactor it so that there are fewer sources of the same truth, which is more expensive in the moment to do that refactoring than it's just to change stuff. But over time for you and for your users, less expensive. If you can, if you can actually pull that off with your, with the likely limited bandwidth. As far as videos go, this is where I think, um, I like animated videos, um, or just like simple animations. Like a lot of YouTubers out there will do essentially almost stop motion style animations where I get changes like, you know, every like 10 seconds or something like that. Those are great because you can essentially uh, record different voice track and maybe different images like a UI or and also same with the UI or something like that. If you have to have a live actor, like even if it's just somebody in your office come in and redo everything over again for something where maybe it's just a 10 second change. If you have the production files, you can make that change happen at, you know, just edit a few things, have someone review it. That is far less expensive than having to redo videos. So looking at ways in which you can essentially remove the live actor component and making it so that you can, um, essentially modulate or make sort of modular a lot of different things. Now, if you can't get the same voice doing it again, then you end up probably have somebody else like record all those lines. Also a good reason to have them being short. It's easier to, to, to just entirely replace a three minute video, which for me takes approximately three to four hours to make uh, than it is to uh, change a 20 minute video, which can take much longer. And yeah, so it's, so I'd say it's another reason why short videos are much cheaper to, to pivot on. Great. Hopefully that answers questions. I guess, yeah, the follow-up questions as, as needed. Sure. All right. Uh, how about this one? Sometimes a procedure is inherently difficult, such as in a product or a feature that hasn't gotten the UX input that it needs. Mm -hmm. What are some ways to reassure a user when this is going to be a long and complicated procedure? All right. I have two answers. The, the unpopular answer uh, is to write documentation that is honest, that pisses off your product team. I have done that in the past. If you would like to not sabotage your career, however, the other answer that I have, um, and sometimes you can actually get away with that. I've actually had a, in one job, I had a reputation for actually doing that. And eventually people came around to bringing me into UX conversations early. Um, but that was honestly, from what I know, that's the rare thing, not the, not the common thing. Um, what I would say is that um, if you create that more honest version of the doc, at least to sort of like from an outline view, um, write the slightly more politic version of it, um, and then just like 
say to like the product team, you see whoever is the right people to show it to like, Hey, I'm putting this out in a week. So do you have any comments on it? Well, and, and, you know, just even things of like, you know, we understand that people have a problem with blah, things like that sort of wording in something uh, is both honest, um, but is not the sort of, it's honest. Your support people are probably going to end up saying something like that as well. So like you might have support people on your side. Also depends on whether your docs live, like your funding comes from a support or product or marketing or whatever. Um, but that's the sort of thing that can really make product people want to fix something. If you're basically kind of pushing them being like, well, you, you made something that sucks. And uh, I, I literally have to make it so that we don't have fewer customers because of it, because I want to keep my job and this is the way I do it. And I've basically said that of like, if you would like me to do things kind of half, like half assed, um, then I should probably find another job because eventually you're going to let me go because we're going to lose customers. Um, that doesn't always work, but occasionally that works. I would <laughs> feel out your actual and find out what version of that works for you. Keep feel like a doctor, like, you know, find out, find out how that works for you kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Results may vary. Exactly. Um, great. <laughs> so coming, actually getting back to um, what you were saying about videos, do you have any recommendations for software to produce the animations that you were referring to? Uh, well, I mean, I use Adobe products. I use Premiere and After Effects. Um, the, I would not say that that's a, an endorsement of them because of the high skill load uh, of them. Um, I don't know what is out there that would really necessarily work for what you, what sort of style of, you know, video you, you want to use. Um, but I would say like, um, you know, uh, I would maybe Google like free or cheap, you know, video editing software and seeing what sort of open source stuff. I know on the audio side, Audacity is sort of the, is the, is the free audio software that a lot of podcasters use. Uh, I don't know what the video version of that is, but I'm sure there is something like that. That's great. Thanks. Uh, thinking about your, the slide that you, uh, the meme that you gave us at the there, end. Sorry, Snagit okay. can apparently do screen capture. So if you're doing screen capture stuff and recording a soundtrack on it, it's relatively cheap. That's right. It is nice. From, it's an expensive. Lisa, yeah. Good tip from Lisa. Uh, all right. Can you can you give us an example or perhaps clarify how we can avoid dying on every hill? <laughs> we, need, yes. we need this wisdom. Let me let me figure out. Okay. Um <laughs> Yeah. So I, in a, in a past job, um, I, uh, essentially had to, I, I tried to sort of fight a bagel, ba bagel, uh, that reminds me of community, a battle with our legal department, um, about, uh, some of the language being used in one of our products. And, like I, I was able to look at it and I didn't even understand why we were having that page show in the first place, let alone why that language was there. I got to the heart of why that language was being used wasn't actually due to legal. It was just something that essentially legal signed off on. And every single other version of that page, I really wish I get into specifics, but it's, it involves internal security products. Every single, I made six other versions of the page, six different things of copy, different arrangements of copy with the idea that uh, people will not hate one of them and will eventually like converge on one after a bunch of discussion. Is this the idea of like, instead of presenting you one solution, I'm going to present many knowing you're going to, you will all argue about it and then decide one of them works and great. Great. And then we just present that to legal. Um, but essentially every single one, like legal just did not give us the time of day to green light it. And I ended up basically, I, I eventually said like, okay, I, I'm not dying on this hill anymore. This is actually like, this is the sort of, of issue that if I just keep trying to like do stubbornly do this for a month, um, like my own, like basically 
you know, great performance review, et cetera, is this going to look like I'm not doing anything? So I'm like, you know what? I, I feel really passionate about the fact that we're doing something unhelpful to users. It's been proven in UX research to be unhelpful for users. But because of all the internal politics involved, I had to say, I am just not dying on this hill. I'm like, okay, I'm not doing on this hill. On a smaller scale version of it, where I really engage it a lot more, uh, it's, a, it's essentially little things of like, as a when I do UX stuff, I'm like, okay, can we can we move this here so that I can put this sort of comment like this? And eventually be like, no. And I'm like, okay, my brain will be like, I said, can we as a polite thing, but I meant do it was sort of the you know, sort of the inside thing. I'm like, no, I, mean, I don't care. I just like be like, I was like, do I actually care about this? Do I want to spend the, 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 the energy to convince someone that this is, you know, necessarily the right thing to do, or even like, you know what, maybe, maybe I just do not care about this in particular, maybe I can say like, okay, I'll, I'll walk away from this. And those sort of small scale ones, whether it's like that or um, wanting to refactor a page and just basically being told like, yeah, that's a great idea, but you know, we don't have the, like, we need you to work on these other things and me trying to argue like those other things are honestly a less priority than this. And let me show you the number of users who hate this page and the sort of the ticket volumes. But when I have people who are trying to be insistent about what my workload is, a lot of times, uh, if I basically can't like, you know, convince people after two different forms of an argument about something, then like, okay, you know what, I'll, I will, I will not die in this hill, or I will not die in this hill today. I will look at that hill a week or two weeks from now. Deferring the hill death is actually a really useful way of just not deciding to never die on it. It's like, once it's gone, you're like, you know what, that's fine. I've, like by that time that you might revisit it again, you will have crossed through many other hills that you may or may not die on. Um, so those are um, like vague because otherwise I would have to like, ex you know, take 10 minutes explaining the entire like backstory of the thing, but hopefully possibly useful uh, there. And I see uh, it's like you can maybe convince someone else to die on that hill. Then that's not you not choosing not to die on the hill. That's you grabbing someone else to die on it with you. Which which can also work, but that's the opposite of choosing to not die in hell. <laughs> all all sorts of uh, scenarios. I like the deferring the hill death. I'm going to remember that one. Thank you so much. That's um that's what I have for questions. Cool. Yeah. So well, thank you all for for having me on uh, for sticking.